And so we had this humiliating experience as the waters kind of swirled over our nose and we knew that we weren't going to go back to every aunt, uncle, and boss we ever had for another 50000 each, that we had tapped out the angel pool, that we were going to have to simplify our... Can anybody turn on the clock starting with how much time I have left? Because I could go all day and I'm... <laughs> Sorry. So we had to simplify our model to something that we thought could work. And the only thing that we had that was working relatively well was this silly little website that we had built to connect our 13 little clinicas. Because one of the things we found is that if care is local in a low-cost setting, it gets better compliance than if you have to drive someone to a temple and park in the Greenberg elevators out to the Smith garage, etc. <laughs> Whatever that stuff was. And so we ended up just rent, and we said, you know, one of the reasons we can't get paid, that reason number two, is that nobody believes our data. Our big data doesn't match their big data. And so how do we get a check out of somebody unless we can show them exactly how much money they owe? The whole point of the business model and of the ACO middle business model and all the other business models that people are now re-talking about is around demonstrating some kind of savings and then profiting those who shopped or innovated or process flowed or lean mapped or whatever it was to get it, right? So we said, fine, we're going to give up on the beautiful bouncier babies and the cool sign, which I still have, and the sound of the babies through the HVAC, and we're going to just do freaking claims. And it was devastating, but we're going to do claims for the babies. That was the idea. <laughs> and so we started just selling the use of our network. And the first big data breakthrough we made was we made it a business model that wasn't about the data or the system, it was about the outcome. What we needed was a paid claim. So we sold our system and our analytics and our service, and it turns out a whole bunch of other stuff, by the paid claim. Does anybody pay for their application to Amazon? Did you have to buy that and have it installed? No? No. You pay for Amazon by the delivered thing. And you can actually look up, find the thing you want, read all the reviews, and go buy it at the corner store if you want. It's on Jeff to make it convenient enough, right? And to iterate that application. They're now iterating, rewriting new releases and testing them every hour at Amazon. Most enterprise software companies in healthcare are every 18 months. <laughs> So suddenly we found ourselves doing not at all what we want, but our business model was drawing us to iterate and iterate, and we found ourselves doing crazy stuff. We actually pulled together enough data, because we had, you know, one of the problems we ran into is some health plans just didn't want to pay, even if we got it right. And their version of the data wasn't the same as our version of the data, and we were saying ours was right, and they were saying nothing, except for please hold. <laughs> and so we got this old guy at the New York Times to write. We, we created an index, a big data index. We called it the pain in the A report, and we then we got him to, we called it pay view. And we got him to write about all the different insurance companies that we had ranked and how big a pain they were to deal with. So what's a data scientist trying to pump a story to this old guy at the New York Times? And he wrote the story, and today we have a really well-read, thank you all of you who review it and use it regularly, leading index, pain in the butt index for dealing with health plans. And the next release is coming out, I don't know how, later this month, so please check payerview.com if you haven't in a while. Uh, and, and update it. And it shows at a granular level all the things that go wrong and amazingly it gets the health plans to wake up and cooperate and integrate their supply chain. Even though we're all supposedly using the same national standards, uh, they somehow leak a little sometimes. But when you focus them on it, they change. So there's a business model causing us to do all kinds of antics around the big data but letting us follow the ball wherever we need to go and, you know, the reason I've Dean has gone public in a business and I get to speak to you guys, is that one of the things that happened was that the doctors that we served got paid faster and faster and faster and lost fewer and fewer and fewer of their little dollar claims, while we did less and less work per claim because we convinced these health plans to let us connect directly into their systems. Does this sound like a problem we've got elsewhere? Lots of systems that aren't connected directly and lots of paper going between even though everybody's got a computer? So this worked. We thought we were done. And then, I may, and this, can we turn off the cameras? <laughs> this is an example where Obama may have been right. <laughs> <laughs> Farzad and company went out and did this, we called it the stimulus, because we were complaining about it and teasing everyone about it. And, hey, stimulus, stimulus. But anyway, they said, we're going to pay $18,000 not for buying an EMR. Because everyone was talking about, you've got to have an EMR, you've got to have an EMR, you've got to have an EMR. And all the vendors were like, yeah. Give it, we'll send in our receipt to the Federal EMR Reimbursement Authority, the, you know, the GSA, and we'll get a check for the EMR. And think of how many EMRs we can sell. It's like Tahoe's, once the government subsidizes them, everyone buys them. 
<laughs> but the government said, no, we're going to only pay if you can actually use data, if you can actually collect 25 data points for 80% of your patients exactly as we tell you, and you have to attest, because they don't have the technology to receive the data. But anyway, <laughs> you have to attest, and we'll put you in jail if you're wrong, but we'll give you $18,000 if you're right, right? And so we said, oh, well, what do you need to do? Well, you need to be a seat chip, dog chip, MU, PU, you know, you're the 82 different committees, and they are arguing, seat chip is arguing with MU, and eventually we found enough committees that would agree that if I went to all those committees, we would be allowed to play, and we turned on this new EMR, because we hadn't done EMR, because so like, we're supposed to, our mission, right, is to get doctors paid more for doing the right thing, and this is a thing that costs you $30,000 to make you go slower and make your data sit in silos that you can't read. No, thank you. Suddenly there's this opportunity to manage information and it gets exciting. We turn the thing on, CCHIT certified EMR, ready to do it, and whammo, 31% of our clients on the system aren't recording vital signs in a way that would stand up to attestation. 71% weren't collecting demographics in a way that would stand up to attestation, and 95% weren't providing the clinical summaries that were part of it. You couldn't, you could lie, and risk, you know. In healthcare, there's a death penalty for speeding tickets, right? So, since they can't really inspect, they just threaten to light you on fire if you're wrong. <laughs> so I was like, we're screwed. We just spent like a hundred million dollars of all nighters and emotional energy building an EMR that actually doesn't get the outcome. And we're supposed to get, and we, we charged on outcome, right? We're a data company. We charge based on the result. So this was a percentage of collections, and if you didn't get the collections, you didn't get revenue. So suddenly our incentive, and this is sort of the point, was not to close the kimono and sort of back away, the well it works, it's certified, and you're not using it properly, which would be the natural instinct of a self-serving maker of technology. Ours was, in fact, to open the kimono. <laughs> now, if you're a white man who wants to open his kimono in public, you can only do it in Las Vegas. So we had to rent a room. And what you can see here is, this is October of 11 data, uh, exactly what percentage of the clients were uh, actually meeting, you know, 8% of your clients over 90 days or whatever stage one was. And then that got enough attention going that we could both rally our own employees and our own data scientists as well as uh, our client base and our account managers and I think somewhat the market to start to track the actual data, right? Start to track the actual compliance against the payment objective. There's money, selfish, filthy lucre in it for us if we can get this ridiculous set of meaningless numbers correct and in line, not our problem, we're going to get this thing. And we drove it and drove it and drove it. At the end of year one, stage one, we had 87% of the doctors over the line. The next closest maker, uh, next closest player wasn't a cloud-based data company. They had less than 45. We're now at 96. And as soon as the government stops dithering about stage two, we'll turn that on and we'll get there too. That wasn't a mean. That was a little mean. Sorry. <laughs> so here you have the second raft of data. Second business challenge, with which by connecting your data analytical skill to a desired outcome and a profit motive, you move towards compliance. And it's nice because you can see just how far away from reality it was when we started with that compliant initial thing. Let's talk about the third thing that's going on, ACO, right? Which, by the way, is like the Athena business model from 1997, not that I'm bitter. Uh, <laughs> so the government says, well, you gotta look at this cost thing. And government... It's just, it's amazing, just about this week, the New York Times, society seems to be waking up to the idea that cost is in some way related to price. <laughs> now, if you've been a price fixer for 50 years, this is a really big idea, right? Medicare, you just say, it's going to cost this, because our committee said that that's a thing, right? And they put it in the list. <clears throat> so they release the charge masters that are using these, which have no resemblance at all to cost in any way. And every report is like, absolutely, Bloomberg and Times got it, and New York Times, and everybody's like, oh, look at this. This thing costs this much, and it doesn't cost anything like that, because Medicare is a price fixer, and all the other blue plans negotiate their own random rates, right? But at least they're lumbering in the right direction, which is terrific. <laughs> this is how it should look, right? So this is the order screen in Athena Clinicals, and in the middle there, the other ones are vapor, sorry, the quality and patient. We throw, everyone wanted to throw in quality, even though no one in Athena knows how to measure it, so that we would be PC. But I'm just going to tell you we made it up. Sorry. <laughs> but we actually do, because our clients, the government won't give us this data, but commercial payers who sign up our clients to risk contracts will give us access to all paid claims data that affect our, our patients, our clients' patients. And so we can actually back in and say, Lopez, fully weighted loaded cost of a hip replacement or hip arthroplasty is $36,000 all in. 
And so now this doctor can start shopping for hip replacements. And by the way, there's his in-network, his colleagues that are all part of the same ACO, right? But we're going to clinically integrate by jamming you onto Epic or, or, oops, or, or, you know, into some system. And make you be employed, right? So you have to order to us. But actually, look at this guy in this particular example. The cheaper one's actually out of network. So he's got a conundrum. He's going to generate more savings under a risk contract sending this to the enemy. Now, if you're the mothership, you can say, boy, we need to, we need to do something with Lopez, Smith, and White. Because otherwise, we're kind of a sham. Right? And we do have some profit motive. Some, but not enough. Which leads to one of my demands. Unfortunately, <laughs> the way the ACL law is written, you pretty much need to be a fox in order to apply for the job of defending the hen house. You need to be 75% owned by providers, and in fact, 85% of the people who have applied are very tightly right. tied to a hospital. Right. If you do a supply chain analysis, where is the fact? The fact that there's 45% more hospital beds than we need? So you're like this big guy with hospital beds, and I'm like, I'll save it, I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of the hospital beds. I mean, not my hospital beds, but I'll, I'll find some. Right? <laughs> so they're going to use their swift, amazing marketing to steal market share, because hospitals are great marketers um, in your dreams. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is there. we just got to keep driving it. There's two people in this room, right? There's an entrepreneur and a regulator, and we both, I've got asks for both of you, I've got ideas for both of you. But first, we have to talk about you have to agree on one thing, or at least I'm just going to ask you to try on one thing. You don't lose your profit motive when your tax ID says nonprofit. I have watched. Thank you. God bless you. Cleveland. I'm just kidding. Uh, I have seen profiteering tactics in nonprofit hospital systems that would make my friend J.D. Rockefeller here blush. Right? You must be on my system that only orders from my ship or we won't give you privileges. Has anyone heard that one? I'll pay you $200,000 more than you're making if you go in my system and we'll have a little non-chat about where you're non-sending people for their non-mammograms. Right? That's happening. Fine! It's okay! Just stop pretending that it's not happening and it's totally kosher. Okay. Now I'm going to go to a thing that's also not happening. Here's the kind of, this is your big data throw. That was an animation of every day over the 1st of December 12 to the 30th of January 13 of flus in the front desk of Athena offices. The aside about for profit is over. I just needed to get that out of my system. I'm back. <laughs> Here you go. And this is amazing. And no one's going to ever do this, something, not ever do anything interesting with this until somebody comes up with a business model. I'll throw this one out to the entrepreneurs. What if there was an emergency broadcast system that went through Hippocrates or some sort of online service that got through all doctors, you could attract their eyeballs, sell it to the pharma people, and get CDC to pay you a little bit to tell you, look, in the next month, 30 days, 10 days, in your market, there will be a tripling of flu, right? Because we see it coming, we're watching it move, and we've watched it move for enough times that we can, with certainty, tell you what your demand will be. No business model, so it's not really gonna happen except for lamely with white paper, you know? But it could be, if we could figure out a business model. Before we get to business model, I have to just... So I'm, going, I'm now at the plea, at the plug section with five minutes left. Three plugs for the regulators. I know you're not all over here, but I'm pretending that this is... Farzad, I love you, man. You're smarter than me. I love your bow ties. I love everything about you. I love what you've done. Please. And I love Sibelius with the 30 procedures. Awesome progress. They're like 30 million that we need. We need them every minute of every day. You must release. CMS data, paid claims data, to people who are covered under the HIPAA. So I have to say that was the point of becoming a covered entity. We're looking at 40 million patients every day. We look at their surgeries and their infections, and we can't look at the rest of their cost picture. The only, we have plenty of information to embarrass them. We just don't have any information to save them any money. <laughs> and I don't know if you know today, but the Deep Geeks, that law, that, that privacy law, uh, lawsuit from the like, 80s that caused the government to not be allowed to reason was overturned today uh, in court. Amazingly, like coincidence. Thank you, Fred Trotter, for noticing that. <laughs> Don't make Fred Trotter sue you to give us the data. You wouldn't like Fred when he's mad. <laughs> thing number two, ACO, neat idea. Love your thinking on that. Started a birth center on it. Think it's awesome. Amen. If you only let wolves, foxes, guard the hen house, you will have only moderate results. There are people, some of them in this room, who would be incented only to generate savings. 
Athena's trying to get in there. We're not allowed in because we're not 75% owned by doctors, because that would make us really good with data. <laughs> and even if we get in and we find a way of wangling into this thing and getting a business model going and everything else, it still won't work all the way because we'll always want to get the savings from someone else. We won't want our clients to get paid less. Luckily, our clients are doctors and not hospitals, and luckily, our hospitals are lower cost. The, you know, the doctors that our hospitals are connected, the hospitals our doctors are connected to are lower cost. So we're the little guys in the community. We're not the AMCs in the middle. So we can do a lot. We just happen to be incented to do a lot. But in the end, our clock should be cleaned someday by a new entrant whose only mission in life is to generate savings. Remember this day when we had HMOs? We all complained. But anyway, they were small and they could shop and they could leave you out of their network. Can you imagine United saying, you know what? I'm going to shop. <laughs> no, they can't. They need every hospital on the planet to cover the size of their network. It's not their fault. Oh, what was the third thing? Whoops, hold on. Oh, oh, okay, look. This internet thing is going to be big, I swear. <laughs> You've got to allow. Look at the supply chain of healthcare. Look at the. You're already doing this. Nice job on the OIG opinion allowing fees for services to be not considered a kickback, but you have to keep looking at the fact that the people who need information are the best ones to define what the information should be, and they should be able to change their mind any time, and the people they need it from, they should be allowed to pay. The fact that they may be in a supply chain relationship, in a referral relationship that would count them as a Stark violator, tough. Get over it. Change the Stark law. Make there be a minimum. Figure, put some pages of stuff that makes you feel better, but you must allow the same supply chain that works with cash machines and mortgage originations and mortgage underwriters and stock traders and stock custody people. Every supply chain in the world, Toyotas and Johnson Controls who make seats, they pay each other for supply chain coordination. The receiver pays the sender. It's okay. That's enough for you guys. Now, the last minute. gave me less time because I need like two minutes, I'm sorry. Um, I'm ahead of some others. Um, here are the three business ideas. Anybody here want to start a business? Please let there be someone in Washington. One, two, three. Oh, okay, I know it's weird. It's not a class participation event. Idea one, take down the silos. In Washington, we have a thing about silos. We protect ourselves with silos, you know, in the 50s, and we just love our silos. Both sides of the aisle. HIE and the, oh, I forgot them all. The HIE was one and the, uh, the, the Rio, remember the Rio? And then there was the community chin, chin, a chin. When I was 12, they had chins. They were going to roll out chins before the internet using the lottery knot lines to 7 Elevens. You can break this. There's no such thing as a working hub and spoke model that can compete with a network. <laughs> Don't forget, see everyone smiling now? Some of this care is cloud based care. How much care goes on right now? How much radiology goes on in the floor of the hospital that should be in the cloud? Dermatology, psychology, medical home stuff, keeping track of patients, all of that stuff could going on in the cloud. I don't know how much, but let's start businesses and find out. If people do these things, if we wick away these wasteful things, not by people generously lighting themselves on fire and ruining their businesses, not by academic medical centers saying, hey, let me take all my $2,500 colonoscopies and give them away, and then have no money, but by people taking them. Right? Then, we'll get to this. Isn't it the case that this is why a lot of us are in the room? Don't people go through 10 years of hazing in medical school in order to be the guy or the girl who gets that level of trust and commitment from that family? Don't we all get hyper and call in the federal government on healthcare because we want, when our family is in this place, to know that there'll be safety? If we build business models that are larger than ourselves, the humblest thing you can do is build a business model that's larger than yourself that will take on this cause and wick fat out of the system whether it wants to be wicked out or not. We will get this. We'll get this for ourselves as caregivers. We'll get this for ourselves as patients and families. And most of all, data scientists will be the sexiest job of the 21st century. Thank you very much.